All right. How would we actually count these particles? How, how would we get actually the uh, numbers that we have over here? Well, it's, for example, here, we want to count particles that have n minus and x minus, okay? So what does that mean? And here comes the particle, and I'm going to make measurements on these particles. So I am interested in particles over here that go towards the left, which are going to have property n minus and x minus, right? But for a certain particle, I can measure only one of those properties. So let me just measure, for example, n over here. And I'm going to get minus h power over 2. So that corresponds to n minus, OK? Unfortunately, I cannot make an x measurement on the left-hand side, OK? But I know that if this uh, hidden variable theory is correct, then the particle that's flying in the other direction must be n plus x plus, right? It's going to have the opposite properties. So now over here, I can measure the x property, and I'm going to get plus h bar over 2. So those particles that have this okay, property, so I should really put s's here, s n and s x. So I measure the spin in the n direction, spin in the x direction in this over here. And if I'm looking at x minus n minus stuff, then OK, that's going to give me n minus on the left and x plus on the right, right? So I'm going to have a similar object here. So these are n plus, z plus. Again, just looking at this experiment, these are the two particles that are generated. I am interested in, OK, n plus, z plus. So I'm going to go through this in detail so that I don't make mistakes. So this one going towards the right is n minus z minus, OK? And so I measure one of them over here. So suppose I again measure Sn here, and I get a plus measurement here, plus h bar over 2. But now I have to measure the z component here, Sz, and I am supposed to get a minus. OK, so according to the <coughs> hidden variable theory, the number of processes that end up like this is going to be equal to <coughs> n plus z plus. OK, finally, let's look over here. This is actually quite simple. Here I have particle which we say has x minus and z plus flying this way. Uh, so that means the part, other particle must have x plus and z minus. So I can measure one of them. OK, so suppose I measure <coughs> s x and find out that it has a negative okay, value. And then on the other one, I measure Sz, and I also find that it's negative. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> experimentally, this is how I would test this theory, right? <coughs> Make the experiment uh, one million times, <coughs> repeat it. OK, three times, so I have to make three million experiments. For the first million, I measure the ratio of that process, which is going to give me the numbers associated with this part of the Venn diagram. Over here, I'll again make the experiment one million times. 
and look at the result of measurements which give that. That will give me the number of particles out of one million that correspond to this piece. And then do the experiment one million times and get that, okay? So <coughs> what, now that we have studied quantum mechanics for one semester, we already know what quantum mechanics predicts for these things, right? So I can now try to find out what the quantum mechanical prediction for these things will be. Let's start with this one. This is the simplest one. What ratio of particles will give me minus h bar over 2 on the left hand side and minus h bar over 2 on the right hand side? Any guesses? Hmm? Any guesses? Okay, so let, let's see. I want the outcomes of this experiment in which I get minus h bar over 2 on the left hand side and minus h bar over 2 on the right hand side. First, I do the experiment and I look at the left hand side. With what probability will I get minus h bar over 2? 1 over 2, right? Because half of the particles that I measure is going to give me minus h bar over 2 and the other half is going to give me plus Okay, so let me call this probability is going to be one half on the left hand side. In fact, this will be the same for any case, any of those three cases. So on the left hand side, with one half probability, I'm going to get, okay, a minus h bar over 2 on the left hand side. As soon as I find that out, okay, so I say, okay, I got one particle on the left hand side with minus h bar over 2 spin in the x, x direction. What does it mean for the particle that's flying toward the right? Quantum mechanics says that that's going to be now in the plus x state, right? So if it is in the plus x state and I make an z measurement on it, what is the probability that I get minus? Hmm? One over two, right? So it's going to be one over two times one over two. So this, which is this easy case, okay, says that if I make this experiment one million times, 250,000 times, okay, one fourth of those cases on the average, I'm going to get minus, minus on both sides. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we said that the probability is one half for the x measurement. Yes. That's given, right? Uh, what do you mean given? Okay. What, 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 what? what? Of, hmm? so, so let's say for another particle, can it be like 90% or 70%? Or no, okay. We are looking at <coughs> random electrons coming in. Why should it be plus h bar over 2 rather than minus h bar over 2 in the z direction? Okay. Completely symmetric, yes. Okay, they are initial. So the electrons that are generated here are completely <coughs> random, uh, zero, zero state, spherically symmetric, okay? Per perfect symmetry. Okay, so that's that. Now, <coughs> let's look over here. <coughs> I am going to make a certain measurement here in a certain direction and then see what happens to the other side, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose now my direction n, okay? So this is my directions. I can make direction, the measurement of the x component of the spin, z component of the spin, or I'll take this going out at 45 degrees, well, okay, so that's going to be my n direction, okay? So it will make 90 plus 45, so this angle here is 135 degrees. And this angle here is also 135 degrees. Okay, so that's my end direction, that's what I decide. Okay, that's what I choose. Okay, so again, 
I make this measurement, okay, and I find out that over here the spin value in this n direction is plus h bar over 2. So it's in this direction, okay? But now, if that's the case, then I know that this is in the minus n direction. So <coughs> I have something that's polarized in this direction. Okay, so this is the minus n direction. And I am trying to measure, okay, the z component of this and expecting to get a z minus. Okay, so I know that the spin or the particle, if I measure it in this direction, okay, is minus n. Okay, so this is down n coming in this direction. And I am trying to measure its z component and trying to find out what the probability is, what's probability that's in the minus z direction. Do you remember the formula for that? Position of z plus and x plus, so we can um, express the express in terms of z. Yeah, okay, but we did that. Okay, remember that. Okay, so maybe I'll <coughs> remind you of what we got. Okay, so we looked at the case when we had the spin. Okay, so let me put remember here. We had these x, y, z, okay, axes. And we also had this n <coughs> direction, which made an angle phi with the x-axis and theta in the, uh, with the z-axis. And he said, okay, if I now take this, <coughs> okay, so if I take a spin, which comes in, remember, chi, and then make a measurement in this n direction, and take plus h bar over 2, and now, okay, so I know that this is up n. If I try to make a measurement which makes an angle theta with it, which is Sz, okay, I get plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. Those are the two possibilities right, h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2. What were the probabilities, do you remember? We said as theta goes to 0, this thing becomes a z, so it's 100%, 0%. If it becomes, okay, well, what are those somethings? Okay, so the probability for this case, okay, remember, is cosine squared theta over 2. Probability for this case is sine squared theta over 2. Okay, so if theta is 0, then obviously you get 100% probability for this case and 0 for that case. If theta is, for example, 180 degrees, if theta is equal to pi, then you are going to get 0 here and one there, because now you have turned your experiment upside down, okay, and minus c becomes z, and plus c becomes minus c, okay? So over here now I have that case, okay? I am going to measure, 
this probability that if I have down n, okay, I am going to measure a uh, minus z. Okay, let me just get oriented. Okay, so minus n is this direction. Minus z is that direction. What is the angle between them? What's the angle between minus n and minus z? 135 degrees, right? So the probability in this case, I calculate similarly. Okay, one half probability to get plus here. Okay, again, I'm going to get plus or minus. And that first measurement is always 50%, right? And then I am going to get cosine squared 135 degrees over two. Okay, what about this case over here? All right, <clears throat> let's just draw a diagram here again. Hmm? Okay, so it's minus n. Okay, minus n and minus c. Okay. Then it would have 45 degrees or whatever. Yes, sine squared. Yeah. Okay, so again, over here, this is my direction n. I make a measurement here and find out that this is minus n, which means that this thing which is flying off here is plus n. Okay, that's what quantum mechanics would say, okay? And if I make now a measurement on this plus n and get plus h bar over two, okay, in the x direction, so I'm getting something over here, when the measurement, previous measurement was in that direction, Again, you see the angle is 135 degrees. Okay, so the probability over here is again one half. Uh, what times the cosine of cosine squared of 135 degrees over two. All right, so let's figure out what these things are and see how the inequality goes. So let's do it over here. Okay, so the probability associated with 135 degrees is going to be one half, right? Cosine squared 135 degrees over two. So it's going to be one half this is going to be, please check my algebra, uh, one half, one plus cosine of 135 degrees, right? So cosine of 135 degrees, which is something like this, is minus the cosine of 45 degrees. So it's going to be one over four cosine of uh, 45 degrees, oops, no, minus. One minus cosine of 45 degrees. So that's going to be one over four, one minus, what? One over square root of two, right? So one over square root of two is something like, what point? No, 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 one over root two is less than one. Never trust mathematicians with numbers, <laughs> okay? <laughs> point seven or something, okay? <laughs> so uh, then you have uh, point three. So it's uh, well, 0.3 over 4. So now what are the numbers? I have 0.3 over 4 plus 0.3 over 4 
is it greater than or equal to 1 over 4? No, right? So this is the quantum mechanical prediction. And so what do you do? You do the experiment and of course all these numbers just fall out and the equality is not satisfied. So that means you cannot just explain this measurement stuff by these hidden variables, okay? There is no way you can use these hidden variables, the variables, you cannot classify the particles like this. You cannot classify the particles as having these properties, okay, associated with them. So whatever is happening is happening according to quantum mechanics as a collapse of the wave function along the way, okay? So the wave function is changing when the first measurement is done, etc. So you could still try to force this, okay? People were so uncomfortable with the concept that there's this change in the wave function over a distance non-locally uh, that they, okay, said perhaps for quantum mechanics, the uh, formal logic is not working or something like that. But okay, you really have to make very strange assumptions to push uh, the uh, notion of hidden variables. Uh, so you can, if you like, uh, read stuff like uh, <clears throat> super de determinism, which claims that, okay, in, all, all of these things are well set, <clears throat> but somehow the flow of uh, the nature is determined uh, since the creation of the universe so that uh, what is going to be measured on the left and the right is predetermined uh, and we have no control over all of these things, so it, which means that <clears throat> these things change depending on what measurements you are going to make. How does the system know which measurements are going to be made, well, the, that's the way the universe is, okay? People, not people, obviously, physics knows that you are going to make X and Z measurements and then everything is, uh, okay? So whenever you try to push something beyond uh, reasonable boundaries, you have to make some unreasonable, unreasonable uh, assumptions. Okay, so this <laughs> just says that we now have a feature of nature by which we can influence, okay, what is going to happen on some other part of space by making certain measurements. Now it turns out that you cannot use this to transfer information, okay, by itself. You cannot just say, I'm make, going to make these measurements and then uh, that is going to be signaling someone at a distance uh, without okay, appending to this some sort of classical uh, information also. But it does, okay, you can use it to transfer some amount of information when you combine it with other classical means of information transfer. Okay, so Quantum information theory is a big thing uh, and so on. Okay, so just, just the fact that you have this entanglement makes many things, okay, many uh, practical sort of applications possible. Okay, maybe uh, I have just 20 minutes. Let me just finish with uh, just introducing you to uh, a, an application of this. So I'm going to erase the hidden variables once and for all. Uh, okay, it doesn't violate special relativity because you cannot use it to transfer information faster than speed of light. Hmm? Effect, is instantaneous. Effect is instantaneous, but it's not useful. Okay, there's no way you can use it to actually uh, 
transfer uh, any material or any information faster than the speed of light. Okay, so it's not it's, it's not really uh, it doesn't violate special relativity. Okay, there's nothing transported from one place to another uh, in space. Well, uh, okay. In special relativity, you are worried about the position of particles that are moving in space, okay? And you have to make sure that the displacement uh, is inside this cone, which means that these things cannot move uh, faster than the speed of light. So over here, you don't have anything like that, okay? So uh, over here, you have just uh, the result of a measurement depends on what's ha happening on the other side, but that dependence does not really uh, give you any advantage, uh, a faster than speed of light uh, advantage at all. If you want to use it to transfer information from one point to another, you still have to send some classical information, which will have to obey relativistic rules. And when you append that information to whatever is going on here, you find out that the information, some extra information is transferred from one point another to another. Okay? Yes. Can you say that? Would be, uh, what we do is not, 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 not what we do, but what, what we transfer is not useful. But still there is some um, information about the particle that is transferred from one point to another, but, uh, not caring about the distance between those two points and happening instant in instantaneously. So isn't this, this might not be useful for our sense of information for the general cases, but still there is something transferred in instantaneously. How does that um, not break the rule? Okay, so let, let, let's look at the scenario. I uh, have this thing, okay, splitting up and we send one piece to one galaxy here, which someone has gone a few light years away and the other one is going to another galaxy, which is several light years away and somehow we have kept the coherence of these things so that they are not uh, disturbed. And then we told these, both of these people that you measure the spin in the z direction, okay? Otherwise, if they both measure it in different directions, then there's no hope of doing anything because then you are going to get random results at both sides, okay? But you say that, okay, this is the direction of z, this is the direction of z, so you both measure your spins in the same direction. So what happens? This person measures the spin in the z direction and finds plus h bar over 2. Okay, so what does this person say? Okay, the other person is making the same measurement. It's going to find this to be minus h bar over 2. So, okay. Hmm? No, how, how can they use it? Okay, so this person really wants to say, I have a new baby, it's a boy. How the, can they use this information to, okay, construct a message? Yes, that's not useful, but I know the information across the universe. Well, okay, so it doesn't count. Yes? So, uh, it, it, in, in a sense that, like, if, if th those two persons were like exchanging some kind of information classically before they were separated, mm -hmm. <coughs> they are like uh, agreed on, like uh, mm -hmm. they, they also have like a, a, a synchronized clocks with them, and they will like, uh, we will arrive there, and at some point in time, I will uh, make a measurement, and depending on that measurement, if I uh, find the plus h bar over two. I will order a pizza, uh, or it's a, if it's minus h over two, I will order a hamburger. Okay. He says, and the other person just waits uh, like one minute longer than 
uh, looks at the particle, makes the measurement, and uh, now uh, they can say that what the other person has ordered one minute ago. But okay. Okay, so, I mean, that's... So that, that's some kind of information? Uh, well, okay, that's not something that uh, is... Okay, so that, that, that's not really transferring information from one side to the other, but it's just <coughs> having a knowledge, okay, on one side of what happened at the other side. Okay, so it's just like saying that I know the other side has plus h bar over 2. How they use that is, okay, something else. Yes? Um, also, in that case, um, since the interval between them is space-like, um, the word um, what he ordered before does not make perfect sense. Because um, in, another, um, in another frame of reference, we can make it so that um, it's after. So, um, he might not really know whether he ordered before or he will order. Um, yes, okay. If you have a reference frame which is moving with respect to them, then of course things get more complicated. But let's assume that they are not moving with respect to one another, okay, so that uh, everything is <coughs> in the same reference frame, uh, synchronized clocks and everything. Uh, so uh, everything should be okay. Yes? Isn't all these problems are related to, we cannot um, determine what we will measure. Uh, I, I guess it's about that. Uh, for, for example, if we could have chosen, we will me measure plus, then we obviously send a message, because I can send one and zero. But if we can't choose, we are just getting probabilistic outcomes of uh, what I will eat, and the, the other side will eat the opposite. Not, uh, Okay, it's, it's not information transfer. Okay, th th those types of things, obviously, you can also decide without all, all of this. You can just say that on Mondays I order pizza and on it's Tuesday. Just like, uh, <clears throat> yes. So then is it because um, they know the shared entangled state beforehand? So it's like you said, on Mondays I eat pizza, so every Monday everybody knows that I eat pizza. It's, it's not in, um, transfer of information because everybody agrees on that I, ate, I eat um, pizza on Mondays. Mm -hmm. It's like um, they agreed on that entangled state. So mm -hmm. it's uh, the knowledge, actually they both know it before the experiment, right? Is that why it's not transfer of information? I guess, okay, so, <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I was, uh, let, let me see, okay, I don't have that much time. Uh, I was uh, planning to talk a little bit about uh, quantum cryptography, how you uh, encrypt messages so that they are safe, but since this discussion, okay, since you seem to be interested in something else, uh, let me try to give you a summary of a very nice article in Physics Today. You have to find it. Uh, I, I'll put it on the uh, web page of the course, but uh, this is some years back, uh, Physics Today. Uh, and I don't remember the title, but it contains the numbers game. Okay, so I don't know the uh, I don't know the precise title, but I'll find it and put it in the web page. Okay, so this is a game in which you have. Okay, so this is just invented for this. Okay, it's not a very useful game, but uh, people don't always play useful games. Okay, so uh, suppose <coughs> you have these two uh, contestants. Okay, so these two contestants are sitting in isolated booths, okay, so I have one contestant here and one contestant here, and there's also someone who is called a spokesperson. Okay, a spokesperson 
makes a statement and then uh, there's a judge here which says, okay, you win or you lose. Okay, so the <coughs> contest is something like this. You are taken, you are, you, you take a, an integer, okay, an integer uh, at random and then you divide it uh, to these two contestants, okay? For example, suppose you take this integer 5 and then you say, okay, you get 2.3 and this one gets how much? The mathematicians amongst you, 2.7. Okay, so this one gets 2.7, right? And then the question is, okay, these two contestants are going to, so only this person knows this 2.3, this point, this person knows 2.7, and they have to figure out whether the total number is odd or even, okay? So what's a good strategy? Okay, these people can send one bit of information to the spokesperson, okay? Yes or no, up or down, whatever. And then the spokesperson is going to say odd or even, okay? So this person is going to say either odd or even, okay? One of them. And if they win, okay, they get the prize. So what's the strategy? Well, they can say, okay, we are going to send one bit of information here. So they can say, I can just let the spokesperson know whether the integer part of this is odd or even, right? So this one will just signal that the integer part is even. This one will say integer part is even. And the spokesperson will say, well, this has an even integer part. That has an even integer part, but they also have fractional parts, which adds up to one. So the result is odd, okay? So if you have just two contestants, you can always win this game. Apart from the perhaps special case when they are given, okay, this is divided as two and three and even, even the... Yeah, okay, that has probability zero. So we always assume that there, there's always some fractional part, okay? Now, so with two persons, this strategy always wins. Now, if you have three or more, then you get into trouble, okay? So if you have three contestants like this, so they work as a team, and now you divide this five into these three contestants. Now there's more than one way you can do it, right? So you can, these things can have, for example, 1.25, uh, 2.3, what's the other one? I'm not good in these things, so help me out. Uh, two, what, one point, uh, so four, this has to add up to one, and, hmm? Or to five, okay, thank you. So I add these things, so it's five. Now they can again do the same thing. They can say, well, we are just going to report the integer parts and the fractional parts are going to add to one and we'll know whether this whole is odd or even. But these three now may add up to one, but they could also add up to two. Right, so I could also have 1.25. Uh, okay, so how do I make this into two? So perhaps one point, uh, let me add 0.5 from this one. Uh, so it's going to be 1.8. Uh, and this one is going to be, I don't know. Hmm? 0.95. Okay, in any case, you get the idea. So in this case, in one case, you, this is one, in this case, it's two. So if you just, they, if they just report the integer parts, okay, 
then there is some uncertainty about the, whether the fractional parts add up to a, an odd number or an even number. And it, as the contestants increase, this becomes more and more difficult. But now in this article, okay, they describe a method in which, okay, you, these contestants, before they go into their booths like this, before they are isolated, they take with them a particle. Each one takes a particle, okay, with them. So it has to be very nice and isolated. So it's a nice briefcase. With today's technology, that briefcase must be the size of a building or something. But okay, in any case, so they take each particle here. So if you have three particles, now you have to look at the zero angular momentum three particle state. Okay, so you have to construct that, etc. So details are in that. Okay, paper actually, it's, a, it's not a paper, it's an article. You can follow the algebra, it's not that difficult. You should be able to follow the algebra, okay? Maybe I'll ask it in the exam so that you'll all have to read it. Okay, so they have the state. And then what happens is they, depending on the number that they get, they make a rotation of their spins. Okay, so the first one gets the first spin, second one has the second spin, third one has the third spin, and they each make a rotation on their, okay, spins, and then make a measurement, and send the result of that measurement to this spokesperson. Okay, so everyone sends just, okay, plus or minus h bar or two, okay, up or down information to this person and they win each time okay so although there seems to be missing information here information missing here that is not sufficient to solve the puzzle this quantum stuff okay because these spins are entangled to one another when this person does something inside this isolated booth that influences what the others have. That one rotates the spin, okay, in his own booth. This one rotates it in his or her. We should at least make one of these girls. Okay, so that they do those rotations, okay, and then make their measurements. And the result of the measurement is up or down. And that is transferred to the spokesperson, and now they definitely win, okay? So obviously some information is generated by those, okay, operations, those quantum operations, so that <clears throat> what is not possible without that quantum effect becomes possible, okay? So uh, that's one way of using quantum information to okay, generate sufficient information to uh, solve a problem. Okay? Any questions? Yes. No, it doesn't work for the quantum mechanical counterpart. Okay, so these Venn diagrams that we had assumes that you can classify particles into these eight possible groups. In quantum mechanics, we don't even use that, okay? We don't even consider that. Because the, this person, okay, whoever is claiming the uh, hidden variable theory just tells us that if you make this measurement on the left-hand side, that measurement on the right-hand side, you get this number. Then you make this measurement, that measurement, you get that number, and that's going to be larger than this measurement and that measurement. So that's the logic behind that inequality. Now, what we do as quantum mechanics is that we just smile and say, no, no, that's not how you do it, all, all those things. If you make this measurement on the left-hand side, so if that's your recipe, I don't have to do the experiment. I can make the calculation. 
I can make a prediction. If you make this on the left-hand side, then the probability of getting that on the right-hand side is that. Okay? Nothing to do with these Venn diagrams or anything. Okay? So that's that probability. That's that probability. And when you add them up, it's less than that. Yes? I was wondering whether it can be associated with some kind of a negative probability or something. No. If you associate, if you start associating negative or complex probabilities or whatever, then it's a good sign that you are not on the correct path of doing anything. Yes? Can I use, use this for the crowded setups where I uh, accelerate the entangled electron and uh, measure the Z component of the spin after I, I put the experiments button at the left and I put the, I put the other experiments uh, button on the right, like because of the relativistic stuff. Okay, so when this thing, of course, was being discussed, a lot of people uh, assumed that, well, perhaps the fact that you are measuring one thing on the left and the right, uh, the other thing on the right is influencing the uh, way the particles are generated, etc. So they did all types of experiments in which, for example, these particles would be generated. And then they said, OK, I'm going to fool you. And they changed the direction of the experiment very quickly so that to see what happens on the other side. But OK. No, Let's say I have a very crowded setup. I can't put another SZ S measurement in the setup. So I create an entangled pair of uh, electrons. I, s I send this electron here. I then accelerate the other one to relativistic speed. And I measure the Z component of the spin in another setup, but influencing this one, they are therefore putting the SZ box here as well. Well, try it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's too complicated. Okay, so I'll see you in the exam, I guess.